are tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Wisdom Wednesday presented always by DraftKings. Next week is Best Ball Week on the regular DraftKings app. By the way, later on this morning on the Fantasy Feast podcast, I am naming the last five or maybe more contestants in the DraftKings best ball draft. Number one against me and Joe Dolan, which should be awesome. Really looking forward to that. You guys know the deal. At Ross Tucker NFL is me. At Ross Tucker Pod is us for all the social clips. And we got to find out what's going on with this big court case involving the NFL. I'll be very curious to get your feedback on whether you're glad I did this interview or you'd rather talk about the stuff inside the white lines. I felt like it was too big of a topic, and honestly, I think I was too curious. Had to bring on my guy, Daniel Kaplan. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, so I've been waiting to try to get to the bottom of this thing because I've been reading about it, but I'm still not quite sure I totally understand what's going on, which is why I wanted to call in, man, a guy I've known for a long time at this point. He's been on the show before, but it's been a while. You can check him out like I do on social media, at Kaplan Sports Biz. He's been all over the place, Sports Business Journal for a long time. Uh, most recently, The Athletic. Again, check him out on social media, at Kaplan Sports, because I actually read a lot of the stuff he posts on Awful Announcing now, which is awesome. So follow Daniel, because he's always on top of all these things. And let's start with this, Daniel. What is this NFL Sunday ticket case about? Give me like the 30,000-foot view. Okay, the 30,000-foot view is um, the the only sports league in America that has antitrust exemption carte blanche is uh, Major League Baseball, because that was a Supreme Court decision in, I think, 1921, 1922, that said baseball was a, wasn't a, was a recreation, it wasn't a business. Um, in the late, late 1950s, the NFL started pooling their broadcast contracts, uh, so they, they would sell the, the, the or then the team sold their TV contracts separately. So the, the Cleveland Browns sold their own deal. New York Giants sold their own deal. And they agreed to pull it. And immediately antitrust concerns came up that you can't do this. You're competing businesses. You can't cooperate and sell TV together. So in 1961, the Sports Broadcasting Act was passed, which allowed sports leagues to pull their, their TV. But this was there was no cable. There was no streaming. There was no satellite at that time. So as media evolved, it didn't get covered under the Sports Business, uh, Sports Broadcasting Act. And what the, the plaintiffs in the Sunday ticket case have, have argued is that the NFL illegally has, has collectively sold the rights to out-of-market NFL games. That's what Sunday ticket is. If you're in Dallas and want to watch a New England Patriots game, you, you, have, to, you have to get Sunday ticket. What the plaintiffs are saying is the, the, cow, the Cowboys should be selling those rights individually um, or – or they need to get a, an exemption through the Sports Broadcasting Act and uh, an amendment to that. So that that's the crux of the matter, that the NFL is illegally conspiring to sell out-of-market TV rights. And the jury agreed. Okay. Wow. There's a lot there. Uh, a lot there. Um, that's interesting, by the way, that MLB... So MLB can basically just do whatever they want? There's been efforts to... Uh, eliminate the the antitrust exemption that MLB has. And there was there was one caveat to that. In 1996, the uh, Kurt Floyd Act was passed, and that that brought labor out from underneath the antitrust exemption. So in 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 sports, things like the draft, the uh, free agency, uh, the the all, all these kinds of player restrict, restriction mechanisms would be illegal if it wasn't collectively bargained. Uh, between the union and management, baseball wasn't wasn't uh, didn't have to worry about that because they were under the antitrust exemption. So in 1996, uh, 
labor was pulled out from underneath that antitrust exemption for baseball. But everything else in baseball, like pooling TV deals, it, it would be exempt. Okay. So in the 1960s or whatever, they said the, the Broadcast Act, they said that sports leagues could pool their collective TV. rights to sell them. But it, it wasn't media. It was it was linear television. And so what, what the plaintiffs in, in the Sunday ticket case argued is that this doesn't fall under that. And the jury agreed. What, what football, what the NFL argued was that the – the contracts with CBS and Fox, which are covered under the Sports Broadcasting Act, are intertwined with Sunday Ticket uh, because there are restrictions on what, what's, what, where Sunday Ticket can uh, can show its games. There are restrictions on how it can be promoted. It has to be promoted as a as a as a as an exclusive premier pre premium product because what CBS and Fox are worried about is that Sunday Ticket will cannibalize their coverage. If too many people have access to Sunday Ticket, people won't be watching the CBS and Fox games. That's and so what the plaintiffs argued is that there was there was an illegal conspiracy to prop up the broadcast contracts at the expense of Sunday Ticket subscribers who, who allegedly overpaid for it. Okay, man, th there's a lot there. Uh, so, who are who are the plaintiffs? Like, are are these people that are really upset? about how much they had to pay for Sunday ticket? Or are these lawyers that saw an opportunity that to go after the NFL and because the NFL, there might be this loophole with it being direct TV and not linear TV and that they could get a big judgment against the NFL. I, I wanna know who sort of the plaintiffs are and who said, hey, let's go after the NFL here. Well, the lead plaintiff is a is a bar in San Francisco. Um, so there's two classes of plaintiffs. They're, they're commercial establishments, restaurants, and bars, and then they're individual uh, subscribers. And so the, there's a named plaintiff for each of those categories. But we're talking about millions of potential class participants from, uh, you think about all the people who, I think the class period is between 2011 and 2022. So anyone who bought Sunday ticket in that time period is eligible. So we're talking millions and millions of uh, people in commercial establishments. Uh, as to as to your suggestion that perhaps this is a, a you know a class action lawyer looking for a big fee, I'm sure there's some of that involved. But um, uh, this case has dragged on for nine years, so there is. There must be some merit to it if it's lasted that long. And the fact it went to trial, that the story I wrote for Front Office Sports a couple of weeks ago, people were shocked the end of, that this case got that far. So there there must be some, I, 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 I'm not going to say it's not going to be overturned on appeal, but there is some there is some merit to that the NFL was, cons was illegally cooperating to bro broadcast Sunday ticket because it's not covered under the Sports Broadcasting Act. Okay. So then, like, I guess my next question is, these people knew what the price was, whether it's individuals or bars, and they chose to pay it, right? I mean, that's, that's one argument. I mean, you... I'm just making sure I understand. Like, the, these people, I've never been a Sunday ticket guy, um, so, but, like, these people, both individuals and these bars, they knew what the pricing was and they chose to pay it because they thought it was worth it to them, right? Right. The, and the NFL's argument is, is along those lines that, look, 90% of our games are on free TV. It's a, it's, a, it's a great model. The viewership's off the charts. It's 93 out of the top 100 shows or NFL games every year. Uh, if If customers want to buy this it's a premium product uh, they they know what it is but if you have an, an illegal cartel price fixing it for that doesn't mean people won't buy it it just means that they're being they're being ripped off on the price I mean, that's the argument of the plaintiff's lawyers and that's that's where this damages came from the the jury figured uh, over the course of the 10 years there was 4.8 billion dollars of overcharges so uh well i i i highly doubt that number will survive an appeal but uh, th that's that's what the jury that's the, that was their conclusion okay so 
how do they come up with what the right number is for this? In other words, like we all knew, okay, you get free games, Fox and CBS and NBC. And then, you know, if you pay for cable, you get the ESPN Monday night game. Now, if you pay for Amazon prime, you get the Thursday night game. Um, if you wanted to be able to see your, if you're out of market and you wanted to be able to see a specific team or see any game, we all kind of knew, okay, then you got to pay for the Sunday ticket. You got to pay more. How do they determine what the right amount is for that? I mean, it's obviously. Well, you, I'll, I'll answer the question. So sorry, Daniel. I was just going to say, it's obviously more, it, it is a premium product. It, it's more than what you get. What It's more than everybody else would get. So you sh free over there on their TVs. So you should have to pay more. I guess what I'm not understanding is how does, how does anyone determine how much more you should have to pay or that the NFL, that it was too much? Like if everybody acknowledges they should have to pay something extra, how do you know what that right number is? How did they come up with their number? In the world of the class action damage experts. That's uh, the, he saw he, when you, when a plaintiff in a class action sues, they have a damage expert, and the damage expert has these alternate realities. Of what what would have happened if you only had to buy one team versus all the teams? What would have happened if you could have bought bought it directly from the, if you're a picked cowboy fan in Boston, and you could buy it dire directly from the Cowboys? Uh, and they come up with alternate models about what that would have cost and how much more the that person paid to Sunday ticket than they would have otherwise in that model. And so the the damages the plaintiffs actually claimed were seven billion, uh, not not four point eight. So even even though they won a resounding victory, the plaintiffs at, at this stage, what we should get into that this is just this stage of the process. Um, the, the it could have been a lot worse. It could have, it could have been more. And remember, in antitrust cases, damages are trebled or tripled. Uh, so we're really talking about uh, nearly fourteen billion, more than fourteen billion dollars. Wow, this is like I'm not a big legal guy, but this is fascinating to me on so many levels. So basically, they're saying they charged more than they should have for Sunday ticket. It, that you should have been able to just do one team for less money. Well, there there are different models. There, the you could have to buy four teams, one team, all the teams, but at a lower at a lower price. Uh, there there was there was text and emails that came out during the trial in which uh, at one point at ESPN had offered the NF wanted Sunday ticket where they'd only charge seventy dollars a month uh, and make it available so you could just get one one team. And the NFL turned that down. Uh, and Bob Kraft in a deposition said that you know. That's too. That was too low a price. You need. You need. It needs to be a premium price. CBS and Fox were very insistent on this point, and the emails came out on, on the from them on this too during the trial, in which they made it clear that they wanted a high price for Sunday ticket because they were worried if it was priced lower, fans would would start going to those games rather than watch CBS and Fox. Got it. Um, okay. So what are the next steps here now, Daniel? Well, there's a hearing, I, I believe it's July 31st, in which post-trial motions uh, get he heard by the judge. And let me take a step back. I mentioned this case is nine years old. This case was actually dismissed at one stage in 2017 by the district court judge. In 2019, it was reinstated by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the NFL actually took appealed that decision uh, and tried to take it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court declined to hear it. Although I will point out one thing when we talk about next steps, in that 2020 decision not to hear the case, Judge Kavanaugh had a side opinion in which he 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 expressed his belief that the NFL should be allowed to pool their media rights and not be not be an antitrust violation. So that's something the NFL is pinning their hat to in this process. So July 31st, uh, l later this month, the the parties get together in the courtroom and the, their post trial motions and what the NFL will. Is, is saying, and this is a process that goes on with jury verdicts, they'll tell the lawyer, the, excuse me, they'll tell the judge, even though the jury said we're guilty, they made a mistake, the, the law says we're innocent, overturn the jury verdict. 
So they're going to ask the judge to overturn the jury verdict. Uh, I, I doubt highly he will do that. Uh, and assuming he doesn't do that, that then triggers the NFL's ability to appeal it to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And if they, and that was the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that sent the case back to the district court. So they'll probably get rebuffed there. And so then the next step will be the Supreme Court. And uh, Judge Kavanaugh has certainly expressed an interest in this case. So they probably have a better chance than most to get heard by the Supreme Court. Wow. Um, how does all this, Daniel, affect like Sunday ticket for this year? That's a great question. And, and one I'm um, I'm starting to take a look into. Uh, there was no injunctive relief in, in this decision. And what by that, I mean, the judge didn't say the NFL has to stop selling Sunday ticket the way it, s it sells it currently. It th That did not happen. Now, could that happen July 31st? At the hearing, I suppose it could. I mean, the NFL is going to look for a stay on all everything related to this case as the appeals go forward. Um, my guess is the NFL will continue Sunday ticket through YouTube TV the way it was last year, the first year of the of the deal. But the clock is ticking. Uh, the the class the class for the current case runs through 2022, 23, 24. All, all subscribers to YouTube TV. They, that could be a new class formed, especially if the NFL doesn't win, doesn't get this verdict overturned. So it's it's it, it's fourteen billion dollars the NFL is facing. It's it could be even more if someone wants to bring a class action on behalf of the YouTube consumers. Wow. So let's just say it holds up, Jeff. Uh Jeff. Uh, let's say it holds up, Daniel. Um, what does that mean? Like, how, how could this potentially affect the NFL moving forward? Well, if, it, it's a big bill. Um, you know, we, when, what, it, I mean, this is a huge bill. I mean, this is bigger, this, as we know, it's much bigger than the concussion settlement. And the concussion settlement was paid by assessing each team um, their pro rata share of the, uh, of the settlement proceeds. Um, this, this is, I think I've seen a number 400 or 500 million per team. If this actually came, came to pass, uh, there, there, there are teams that really probably couldn't afford that. It depends how, how, over how many years it would be spread out. Teams would have to take on more debt. The NFL would probably have to loosen their debt restrictions. Um, they would certainly have to allow more private equity. They're most likely going to allow private equity to buy minority stakes of teams, but later this year. So maybe they expand that that process. Uh, I mean, for, I know we're talking multi billionaires in many of these cases who own the teams, but four or five hundred million is still that that's a steep that's a steep number. And I would imagine it would you know around the edges it would it would have an effect on the pre game presentation, stadium development. I mean, if you're the Chicago Bears and you're looking to build a two billion dollar stadium in downtown Chicago and you suddenly get hit with a five hundred million dollar assessment, you're gonna that's that's going to have a big impact you know i i don't know i i guess i'm so big daniel on personal responsibility and personal accountability in life that i guess i look at it and say these people didn't have to pay for it like they didn't have to they didn't have to buy sunday ticket i mean i i don't know and I'm sure a lot of my listeners bought Sunday Ticket, and obviously they listen to a daily NFL podcast, so they're diehards, and I get that. And so they probably think, yeah, they did charge me too much, and I don't know, maybe they did. I, I, I don't, I really don't understand how they come to a number of what the right thing was to charge people. Number one, and then number two, I guess I don't typically have that much sympathy. I guess. For people that uh, made a conscious decision to pay a certain price for something, does that? I mean, I don't know if that sounds crazy, but it's like no, they, I, they, I, didn't, I, they didn't have to pay for it. Like they, 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 it, nobody was holding a gun to their head. They decided they wanted to pay whatever it is, three hundred bucks. I don't even know, one hundred fifty bucks, whatever it is for Sunday ticket. They decided that was worth it to them, so they did it. I, it it's the same reason, like. I don't get all up in arms, Daniel, like a lot of the former NFL guys <clears throat> about like our retirement package, right? Like, oh, our pension's so small compared to other sports. Our pension should be more. Do I wish it was more? Absolutely, I do. 
but I I knew what it was when we were playing. I I knew it was four hundred seventy dollars a year for every year you played when you turned fifty five. Like I just feel like after the fact to complain about it, say we should it should be more than that. Well, yeah, it would be great if it was more than that, but we knew what it was when we were doing it. I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't have a lot of sympathy to be honest with you. <laughs> It's why the NFL describes it as a premium product because they're saying it's not an essential. It's not something, it's not like it's price fixing in food prices or gasoline prices or things that are essentials to. Right. It's a, it, yeah, it's not like bread or milk. I mean, it's like a conscious decision. I, wrote, I Now let's talk about the chances of overturn on appeal. I wrote a story two or three weeks ago for front office sports in which I quoted, I talked to a lot of legal experts and that story's theme was the NFL is going to lose this jury trial. Uh, that that was the theme of the story, and it, it panned out. Um, and the reason is, it's 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 a flip of the coin when you go, go before a jury. It, the week before this went to the jury, the judge had the parties come up to come up to the bench, and he chastised the plaintiff for putting on a what he called a gobbledygook uh, presentation. And he said that he thought this was a simple case, and the plaintiffs had complicated it. The jury obviously disagreed, um, but there. There, and this underscores what the legal experts were saying is a jury trial in Los Angeles, the, you know, hitting the big bad NFL, which is super wealthy with hurting the, the local bar in San Francisco and overcharging them. That's that it, it, it was it was easy to see coming. So the next, the next question is on appeal. What chances did they have? And I think I mentioned the, the Judge Kavanaugh opinion in the 2020 uh, decision not to hear, hear the case at that time. Uh, it gives the NFL a lot of confidence. They they think um, they think they they have very strong grounds on appeal, and I, I don't detect a lot of concern at, at the NFL headquarters right right now. Interesting. Check him out on social media. He's the man at Kaplan Sports Biz. As you can tell, nobody better. Daniel's all over it, and I I just there's nothing else going on right now, and I just felt like it, it could change what our viewing is like this year. I just want to make sure I knew what was going on. And Daniel, you were the perfect guy to do that. Thank you so much for the time, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Awesome stuff with Daniel Kappa. Man, does he know his stuff. I know my stuff when it comes to beer. That's why I drink Labatt Blue Lights with friends, live life to the power of we. It is the day before 4th of July in the United States. I will be having plenty of these over the next four days. Always enjoy responsibly delicious beer it just has that nice flavor to it pristine canadian pilsner if you are if you were labat usa buffalo new york tux takes all right ross giants head coach brian dable he's expected to take over play calling duties so you see this sometimes when coaches are on the hot seat and so it's not a surprise it's always interesting too right because he got the job initially because of his acumen as a play caller when he was in Buffalo. But his OC, Mike Kafka, does a really good job. And I thought two years ago, they were excellent before Daniel Jones got hurt. So that's something to keep an eye on for sure. Former number one pick, Jamarcus Russell, he was fired as his high school's head coach and he's facing a lawsuit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I uh, Very, very upsetting for me when guys that have the ability that Jamarcus had, the opportunity that he had, the money that he got, and are in situations like this. You know, I used to be the moderator at the Rookie Symposium, primarily to try to have players avoid situations like this. And you promised on Monday you would talk about what it was like for you at the Kelsey events last week and not just how great it was to raise money. Well, so first of all, I was in a hurry to get from the Dan Patrick show in Milford, Connecticut, down to CIL, where I uh, met up with you, Jack. Right when I got there, they introduced all of us. And everybody else had been having fun for a couple hours. I was like, whoa. It was, I might have Bo Allen on, who was there as well, former Eagles, Bucks, Patriots, D-Tackle, to discuss it. It was electric. And doing a lot of stuff in the Philadelphia area felt cool, right? I never played for the Eagles, but felt cool. And then the next day... You are looking at the celebrity bracket champion of the New Heights Beer Bowl. My partner, the first couple rounds was Connor Barwin. He had to leave. He was like an executive for the Eagles. 
So then Bo Allen took over, and we just kept winning. It was an incredible, incredible two days. I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out MyFrontPageStory.com. I just can't highly recommend it enough for anything that you need to get someone a gift for. Anniversaries, weddings, birthdays, retirements, MyFrontPageStory.com. Also, shout outs to BackOfficeSchedule.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, Pizza Boy Brewing.